Hi, I'm Brad Power, and I'm the host of the Prostate Cancer Lab uh, with uh, Rick and Brian. And today we're going to be focusing on uh, cancer treatment and testing and a decision tree. And it's some work that uh, Rick's been working on, Brian's been working on, and we wanted to share it with you all uh, to get feedback, comment on how we can make it better. Uh, those of you who know about such things may know that there's something called the NCCN guidelines. Uh, National Comprehensive Cancer Network, I guess, NCCN. And um, they provide guidelines that are the standard of care for treatment. And they have, they publish, I think every six months, um, uh, uh, a, uh, again, the standard of care, the practices, and they've got one for advanced prostate cancer. And given all the learning that we've been doing, we thought we might be able to help them by enhancing it. And also this is to reflect for those who might be interested, uh, Rick's journey and Brian's journey. So I think that's what Rick has to present. And that's the discussion for today. Thank you for all who are joining. And um, as usual, we'll have notes for those who aren't here today so they can participate asynchronously. Take it away, Rick and Brian. Okay, Brian, do you have anything or I could start off or? You, 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 you can go ahead and start off. Okay, I'll, I'll share my screen. And give me a moment. Okay, a little background. When I first got a prostate cancer and my prostate removed, I was at City of Hope and I talked to uh, my medical oncologist, uh, Dr. Young Liu, and uh, he told me my uh, next therapy steps were going to be completely in line with the NCCN guidelines. He said that he, this is a comprehensive cancer center and they do not go wild west, you know, off guidelines, they, they are, a guidelines focused um, comprehensive cancer center. <clears throat> so I didn't know what those guidelines were. So uh, we are advocating advanced testing and personalized medicine that will help direct patient care. Uh, and I wanted to know how that advanced testing, where, where's the value? Why, why should we do advanced testing? We have these guidelines. Uh, are, are they good enough or where, where do they end? So that was what I was looking for. So this is, um, um, I guess this image is from 2020, but the, the guidelines are from uh, January, 2022 that I'll be discussing. So, that, uh, so this is my interpretation of about a 60 page document uh, two documents. Uh, one is uh, physician and one is uh, advanced patient uh, focused. So here we go. Uh, one little shout out on, uh, you know, the pedigree of, you know, where I tried to organize um, this decision tree. Uh, this is um, first uh, 10th of January, 2022. And interestingly, uh, which I didn't know before, but Tanya Dorf, who is uh, um, guiding Brian and I, uh, is one of the authors. And so is Raina McKay, who is also guiding us. Um, so I look across this list of authors, and so I go, well, this is, <laughs> this is about as prestigious as it gets. So here we go. This is my interpretation. Um, so this is a decision tree and it's boiling down 50, 60 pages of what are the decisions uh, that uh, the therapeutic decisions uh, outlined in the guidelines. So uh, I'm going to start with the prostate removed because that's advanced. I mean, there's some other guidelines, you know, for determining when to take out a prostate or, you know, but I'm starting here at when the prostate is removed. <clears throat> and if your PSA, here's the guidelines. Uh, if your PSA is stable, uh, you are, there's some gonna be some acronyms here. So I'll, I'll go over them. 
you're called you're called castrate naive prostate cancer that's cnpn and m0 means there's no evidence of metastases so your psa is stable you're you have not and castrate naive means you have not gone on androgen deprivation therapy just so you have not seen it yet so uh at that point if you're stable you just observe and you know brian and i both wish we were stable when my prostate was removed my psa was 0.6 uh 0.2 is the definition 0.2 and above is the definition of biochemical recurrence so right after i had my prostate removed i still had uh, I was not stable and, it, and uh, my PSA was going up. So I fell into this category. Okay, got your prostate removed, PSA is rising. Um, so now what do we do about it? Um, and so if uh, this is guide nine within the uh, NCCN guidelines, and there's two choices here, M0, uh, again, it's castrate naive prostate cancer. M0 means there's no evidence of metastases, uh, of a direct concentrated metastases from any imaging, uh, but I do have a uh, rising PSA. M1 would mean there's evidence of metastases that are clear. Um, so the guidelines say, and this is what Dr. Lewis, City of Hope told me, okay, we're putting you on by calutamide and Lupron. Okay, and, and bold means the NCCN preferred options. So within these options, um, there's a lot of bold, but you know, the, this first guide, uh, both Brian and I were in purple. So I, I'm red, although I you know, deviated from Brian's journey on the second step, but the purple, we shared the same first step. Bicalutamide is um, uh, androgen deprivation therapy and Lupron is another. Uh, Lupron's a shot, uh, bicalutamide is an inexpensive pill, uh, and both are meant to uh, knock down uh, the androgen feeding the cancer. So at this point, I thought I'd stop. Is there any questions? Am I connecting okay? Doing well. Okay. Um, you know, it, this should look really familiar uh, to any advanced prostate cancer patient. Just but... one question, Rick. Sure. Do we have any statistical information about this success and failure at each stage or step? That's a great question. Uh, you know, that is, I don't have that information. Uh, I would not go, go, Brian. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so that's a great question. Um, uh, I was uh, surfing with uh, one of my uh, dear friends, uh, Ryan Graff from uh, Foundation Medicine yesterday, and we, uh, in between catching waves, we were we were talking a lot about the NTCN guidelines, and we're going to have a little bit of a separate session with him. He, he um, He's really in charge of a lot of data um, at Foundation Medicine. He has his hands on tons and tons of data, and that's one of the directions that I think that we want to go is... How and I'm kind of getting I'm getting a little bit to the punchline here, so I want to be a little bit careful. But um, <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is just such a rudimentary guide, and we think that there are opportunities for us. I'll keep it. I'll keep a high level right now. More data into this, and response data is one of those elements that we would love to add to it. So Ryan could potentially help us tremendously in that effort by looking at real world evidence um, to determine what are the response rates for um, each of these different uh, scenarios. Also, also, if we can find any uh, genotypes for success or failure behind. Exactly, it. yep, he, he's yeah. the guy. Well, yeah, he's, he's, he has a lot of that information, but we're, we need to kind of like peel that onion a little bit to understand exactly what uh, genomic information they actually do have. Um, but at a minimum, I think it's going to be a great place for us to start. Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Saeed, I just, uh, <clears throat> as we go through, through this chart from left to right, you'll see the rightmost is the second line therapy. And 
<clears throat> within the NCC and guidelines, you're starting to get genomically driven decision making. Doesn't doesn't kick in until you're um, castrate resistant, metastatic, <laughs> and second line. But that's where uh, um, genomic information would guide whether you would get. Uh, Pembro, which is a PDL1 blocker, and that's based on genomic information and in some of these. So we'll, we'll get there. Uh, I'll, I'll try to cruise through here, but uh, all questions are great. Uh, both Brian and I did get external beam radiation therapy. So I got salvage radiation as well as an SBRT, which I don't know whether, but you know, we both had salvage radiation at, at this point we were hopeful that salvage radiation would have cleaned us up. So after we left this box, um, we were told you have an incurable disease and you will uh, manage this until uh, the end. But we had, we had hoped and everyone hopes that salvage radiation, there is a, a hope that it's confined to the pelvis area, uh, but it didn't work for us. Okay. so. For me, uh, bicalutamide lasted a while. I, la I made it almost a year on bicalutamide and Lupron, and my PSA started rising. Brian, I don't know how long you lasted, but... I, th I, th I think that's about the same for me as well. I mean, it was a little bit hard to tell because, you know, it, it overlapped with the radiation. And so right. what was actually um, providing the benefit was, you know, a little, uh, a little muddy. Good point. But... After a year, after the radiation, my PSA started going up fast. It was clear that bicalutamide was not controlling my disease anymore. And uh, then now we go to the next box. Okay, this is guide 10. And now I'm castrate resistant because I have been exposed to uh, uh, androgen deprivation therapy. My PSA doubling time was less than 10 months. I mean, my doubling time was like three weeks. It was scary. I think Brian also had a scary doubling time. Very aggressive. Um, and these are the three uh, preferred options. I was told darlutamide is the uh, newest generation and uh, androgen receptor blocker. Uh, so with the least side effects. So I went on darlutamide. So, uh, you know, if I would have been stable, I'd just be an observation, but the decision was uh, to go to the next step. And I went on darlutamide, which unfortunately didn't really work very well for me. I only stayed on darlutamide for four months and my PSA was higher than when I started. So I didn't get a benefit. And Brian, I'll let you weigh in on uh, your apalutamide experience. Yeah. Uh, so I got about 15 months of benefit. Um, so that was, that was great. And then I actually um, decided that I was going to take a, a holiday. Obviously this was in conjunction with my, my medical oncology team, but we decided we we're going to take a break. Um, and that was from all androgen deprivation. So when you're on apalutamide, you stay on uh, Lupron. So it's Lupron plus apalutamide. Um, I took a complete holiday and Unfortunately, within about three months, my PSA, which went, uh, was undetectable when I ended apalutamide, uh, began to skyrocket uh, in the doubling time of, I think, um, two to three weeks. So very aggressive. Yeah. Um, not, so this was not good for, for me. At least you got a little time and a yeah. holiday. So, okay, darlutamide doesn't work for me anymore. And so now uh, I have been, uh, I've had PSMA scans and I've gone from M0, meaning no detectable um, metastases from a scan. Obviously something's going on because my PSA is skyrocketing uh, to I was scanned and I have four or five uh, lymph nodes uh, that are lighting up from a PSMA scan. So I am now uh, called nodal positive to my awareness. And so now I'm graduating to the M1. You know, I'm obviously not maintaining, I gotta do something. This was a scary time for me um, because I felt like I was 
as a patient, cancer patient, I was falling and I needed a parachute. And I, this transition didn't seem um, proactive. It seemed reactive. I think it caught my oncologist up by surprise that I didn't respond very long to darlutamide. It was like, oh, what do we do? So it shows, uh, I'll speak for my journey first, uh, that I went on docetaxel, same as Brian. <clears throat> uh, Brian also had abiraterone, and uh, I'll let him describe that, but I went on docetaxel. My medical oncologist told me, uh, you're falling fast here, guy. Uh, we need to hit it with something that we kind of know is going to catch you right now. And that's your best bet is docetaxel. And I also was able to sign up on a clinical trial uh, where, uh, as advocated by my uh, medical oncologist team, uh, led by John Shen at the time at UCLA, and he is again, uh, why not go on a clinical trial that includes docetaxel? So why not go on um, a PD-1 inhibitor and an adenosine inhibitor that is a clinical trial uh, being run uh, by Arcus Biosciences. Some of you guys may know, I, I worked at Amgen for 17 years and I worked with Terry Rosen, uh, who is the CEO of Arcus because we worked together. I actually reported to him at Amgen. So I, I know the, the science, I know his rigor. Uh, so I kind of guided towards this docetaxel PD-1 adenosine inhibitor, but it was a uh, randomized trial. And unfortunately, I got the docetaxel only arm. So that was a bummer, to say the least. I, I kind of had hoped that somehow good karma would come in and get the right uh, docetaxel and immunotherapy arm, which I'm hopeful has a synergy, but it didn't, those cards didn't fall my way. Um, so the options were, uh, as, as you can see here, you know, the, the differing options, and this is the one I chose. I didn't have any evidence of bone uh, metastases, so obviously I'm not going to go on radium-223. <clears throat> so I am on docetaxel currently. I've just finished seven rounds. It has held my uh, uh, disease progression in check. Uh, I wish it would have shrunk more, but at least uh, it's stable. And right now, stable is wonderful. Brian, I'll, I'll let you take over. <laughs> sure, yeah. Thanks, Rick. So um, if you just kind of go back to the, the prior box, just to calibrate, um, again, Rick was on darolutamide. I was on apalutamide. I took a, a holiday, and that was um, beginning March of 2020. And within three months, I went from a 0 0.02 PSA to a 0.77. So just blazing fast. And um, there was actually no evidence of disease uh, when my PSA was at the 0 0.02 level in March. And within three months, I had six metastatic lesions uh, that were identified through um, whole body MRI, PSMA PET, traditional CT scans, et cetera. Uh, so we decided that we were going to uh, do surgery. It was, my METs were entirely soft tissue based. I have no bone METs. I've never had bone METs. And they were located in the peritoneum, just underneath like the, the belly button area. And uh, so they had surgery. Um, prior to surgery, my PSA had gone from that 0.77 level in June to 2.05 or something like that in August of 2020 when I had my, uh, my, my surgery. After surgery, my PSA dropped from, call it from two to one. And we knew that we didn't get all of the, um, they, they removed six lesions, but they weren't clean margins. And I also knew that I had some caking still in the peritoneum that they couldn't surgically remove. So we knew that we were going to have to have a systemic therapy. Uh, and so 
if you come over into the uh, CRPC M1 guide 11 or guide, uh, is that, I think that's 11, right? Or is that 111? I think the NCC, I think NCC and guidelines meant 11, but it's actually 111 in the guidelines. Okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> Just um, <clears throat> so, so, uh, so my systemic therapy was a combination of docetaxel, similar to Rick's, but they added um, Pembro, Pembrolizumab, um, because my DNA uh, suggested that uh, I had one targetable mutation, which was PBRM1, and we thought that we could hit it with um, with Keytruda uh, in combination with Keytruda, or sorry, with docetaxel um, to um, you know potentially um, uh, target it, and. You know, so I did that. I did that for about, I did six rounds of docetaxel and then finished that in October of last year. And in in, sorry, I, I finished docetaxel. I continued on Pembro and then I finished Pembro uh, in the October timeframe of last year. And the reason I stopped was because uh, my PSA began to rise. So that gets us over into the next box, which is guide 12. My PSA began to rise um, and we decided that we were gonna go on abiraterone. And so I am currently on abiraterone. I started in November of last year. Uh, I've got you know five, six months under the belt and my PSA has gone from about a 0.91 to 0.45. I'm gonna get some labs today. We'll see if I'm still if I'm still responsive or not, uh, but um, but after abiraterone, then then the question is, you know, what do we what do we do next? And um, you can see here that there's still a family of drugs that we could go after. There's I, there's there's uh, additional chemo. Um, I've had one oncologist even recommend that I try darolutamide. Uh, even though I think that there's evidence that would suggest that the transition across uh, second line hormone therapies is not terribly um, effective. Um, but I've had one, one oncologist recommend that. Um, the, the other one that obviously um, comes, uh, comes to mind for many is uh, Pluvicta, which has got a FDA approv approval, so a radio ligand. Uh, and, um, and that is certainly one uh, other option, um, but there are others. And um, Rick, I don't know. Do you want to get into the other, into the the next round, or you you want to talk a little bit more about this? Uh, yeah, I'd like to. Well, first, this is a good time to ask: Is there any questions? Are we connecting here with uh, this interpretation? If, this if I could just jump in, uh, clustering the treatment in just sort of in broad strokes and getting a, a you know, level above the detail, you hit it first with androgen deprivation. And that's in that second box. That's all of those guys, I guess, in, in the first box as well. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I guess chemo is next after that, that because you didn't mention, but docetaxel is chemo. Correct. And then there are, Thank there's you. the PD-1, PD-L1. So there's immunotherapies. Um, and then Pluvicto is on a different, you know, uh, treatment met methodology, which is uh, radio ligand. So radiation that's attacking uh, unique antigens on the prostate cancer. Am I right about that? Is that the so yeah. so you got like four or five categories uh, where some of these drugs are uh, similar in their uh, attack pathway? Yeah, correct. So uh, prostate cancer is a hormone driven cancer. So by shutting off androgen is the first step to shut off the drive, you know, the hormone drive of the cancer. And when that's kind of running out, uh, then um, there, there is still some more uh, abiraterone is a hormone uh, related therapy, but docetaxel goes straight into chemo, um, you know, killing all fast dividing cells. Um, so I think you're on the money. A Pluvicto, I don't know where to put this. This is not in the guidelines, but it was just, uh, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, uh, but uh, this is of 
tremendous hope to me and Brian. Uh, this is a radio ligand that um, uh, targets uh, PSMA, which is prostate surface marker antigen. So this is um, a surface marker. Uh, it's a protein expressed on uh, prostate cells, cancer cells, and all prostate. Uh, and rather uniquely to my understanding, which is a wonderful target. Uh, so attaching a, a radial ligand is the kill or the bomb uh, to have Pluvicto attach to the cell surface marker uh, and then bring a death uh, radio ligand. So that's the concept there. Uh, so let me give a little just one question. The... Sorry, just sure, uh, one sure. quick question. Yeah, uh, very useful decision tree, but it seems branching is all, only depends on the PSA. Yes, and your uh, decision making is only PSA based. Correct. This is I, I tried to faithfully lay out the guidelines. This is the guidelines. If I go to guide twelve, you know, guide one eleven, this is only. PSA decision, uh, but I'll, I'll get into it a, a little bit. Uh, it in... means it can be as, as a base, but it seems there is a place room for a lot of improvement. Yes, yep. yes, sir. There's actually there's actually two two um, decision points. One is, um, are you metastatic, and or, or or not? That's the first one, and then the other is PSA. So it's it's really just two dimensional. Right. Now, in the left three boxes, there is no particular uh, personalized medicine going on. Maybe if you could say it, it'd be personalized if, if you uh, had a metastasis to the bone or not. That would be a personal decision. But otherwise, largely, and you know, this is my interpretation. You know, I'm not an author of this. Uh, I'm a patient trying to figure out what to do next. But in my uh, understanding, the left three boxes, the standard of care has nothing to do with individual patient information. It's not personalized at all. This is population statistic based, which is fine. If it works, it's great. Hey, you know, th these are relative, Lupron's not cheap, but bicalutamide's cheap. You know, so it's easy to get reimbursed. After you graduate <laughs> graduate from these boxes, you're starting to get into guidelines that do bring some uh, decisions uh, at personalized level. So uh, I've had my tumor sequenced. Uh, so so is Brian. And uh, for this box, you you'll see. Okay, you could just do abiraterone. That's independent of any personalized. But we get into olaparib. Okay, this is homologous recombination repair. I actually have a CDK12 mutation <clears throat> that is uh, in one of these uh, genes. So including the guidelines as tumor testing for homologous repair, uh, and here are the genes. So if you have a mutation in one of these genes, uh, which is recommended by the guidelines that you get uh, sequenced, then you might be a candidate for olaparib, which is a PARP inhibitor. Uh, and I don't want to get into every detail, but just uh, at this line, at this point, if you're microsatellite. Um, and I tried to define all these in case people don't know these acronyms. Microsatellite instability high would indicate uh, that you might have a lot of mutations which uh, might attract your T cells, your CD8 T cells for the kill. And those T cells might be attracted and be uh, immunosuppressed by PD1, uh, PDL1 rather. Uh, so you might be a candidate for uh, a PD-1 inhib inhibitor, which would be pembrolizumab. So now we're talking about some personal guidance. Uh, 
Uh, if you have a mutation in the BRCA gene, which I, I didn't even know what it meant until it stands for breast cancer, but it's an important <clears throat> homologous recombination repair gene, which repairs double-stranded breaks. If you have uh, mutations in this gene, then you're a candidate for rucaparib or, you know, so we're now getting into uh, decisions based on personal uh, you know, on your genomics, um, which is a good thing in, in my mind. Uh, Pluvicto also could be considered, uh, although population statistics say uh, PSMA is highly expressed, and you can verify that from a PSA, uh, PSMA scan. If your scan lights up like mine does with the lymph nodes, there's no question I'm, my cancer is highly expressing PSMA. So this would be a good choice. So, okay. I'm, I think uh, I'm kind of done with this. This is the guidelines. Uh, if it's perfect time for questions, if does anyone, I hope it, I'd just like to say before I ask for questions is I wish I would have known this because I was like this little naive bunny over here had no idea what was coming ahead or no idea of the strategy. And, you know, when your doctor puts you on the first thing, they, they at least what happened to me, it was kind of like, we'll put you on this stuff and we'll see how long it goes. And hopefully it goes a long time and no concept of what's ahead. So I hope this brought some light in that regard. Is there any questions? Yeah, th thank you, Rick. Let me, let me just moderate this a little bit by asking first the four prostate cancer patients that are on the call. So we've got Steve Abbott, Ken Anderson, Jan Sobieralski, and Mike Yancey. Um, so let me just go in that order real quick and get their feedback. Like, is this useful? You know, because that's the intended audience. We're trying to say, you know, other people who would be patients going down this road, would this be useful for them to um, have this kind of laid out for them and explained? Um, Steve Abbott, would you mind uh, giving a little bit of feedback? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I would agree. And I, I would say it is very, um, it would be very useful. I, I, I found the, this whole, uh, <laughs> this whole tale frighteningly similar to kind of my, my journey as well. So I'm kind of pretty much where, um, where the guys are, but um, so it's all very, very similar, but I think for someone, you know, like uh, someone like maybe Mike who, on the call, who's maybe not quite where we are yet, this, I would think it would be very, very helpful. Okay, I'll use that to cue Mike. Uh, Mike, would you, uh, you know, give any feedback or comments? No, I, I find this very, very helpful to me uh, because I wasn't aware of, I'll say, I'll say all these uh, boxes, if you will, of, of treatments based upon, like you say, whether you're static or not, uh, as, as well as whether your PSA is stable or rising. Of course, in my case, even though uh, my diagnosis was immediately in the M1, area. Uh, so they kind of you know, started with, you know, I'll say PSA rising, they're looking at that box, you know, guide 111. You know, of course, I had, you know, uh, docetaxel, Lupron, etc. And, and it has knocked down the PSA significantly, and it seems to be holding at this point in time. But that's why I am pushing and looking at making some changes to get sequenced, etc. So that I can hopefully be doing some planning for what the next step might be. So this is helpful. Great. Uh, Ken Anderson, I know you've got a lot of experience in this. What, any, any feedback from you? Ken, you're on mute. Hey, Ken, uh, unfortunately, driving to the airport, so I can't really talk and drive at the moment, but thanks for checking. All is good. I'd love to get my two cents if possible. Cool. Okay, Ken. Uh, if you have a chance to give us feedback uh, when you when you land and can send some email, we'd appreciate it. Um, uh, Jan Sobieralski, uh, do you have any comments? Uh, yeah, I'm on, I'm in the car too, driving. Just about to drive to an appointment. Um, I just like to say that you know I basically am uh, you know castration se uh, sensitive, so I, I it's worked very well for me. Um, my only comment would be, I'd like to see the pluvicto pushed up to the earlier 
stated treatment from the research I've done shows that Pluvicto is much more effective in the earlier stages of your treatment than in the later stages of the treatment. And this is according to like Dr. Moyad for the, from the Post Pro Prostate Cancer Research Institute down in California. He's, had, he's actually sent a lot of patients overseas like to Australia and, the, and Germany and stuff over the last few years. And they found that people that were treated earlier in their, in their, in their treatment came out a lot better from the treatment that had almost full uh, uh, you know, remission in, in the disease. Whereas people that, of course, people that were, um, what do you call it, uh, sensitive, castration sensitive, they, they did not respond at all. There was about 30% of the people who did not respond, about 30% respond extremely well, and another 30% were kind of neutral. Of course, 30% didn't respond at all, uh, did not allow in 68, uh, um, you know, scan, PET scan. And um, so that's a, that's a good indicator that if you don't respond to that, then you're not going to respond. Thanks, Jan. Um, uh, oh, sorry, do you have more? No, I'm good. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Stacy Hurt raised her hand. Stacy, you have a question, comment? Yeah, thanks, Brad and and Rick and Brian. Thank you so much for um, sharing this. I'm I'm not that familiar with prostate cancer, so I'm. This is great to learn. Um, my comment was, you bring up a really interesting point that you know when you were starting treatment that really and correct me if I'm wrong. So like the oncologist didn't lay out the NC NCCN guidelines for you at the beginning you basically went, I see you shaking your heads. Okay. Um, you basically went and sought out this information as informed advocates for yourself to find out what the protocol was. And, um, you know, I do a lot of broad level advocacy work and it just is making me wonder because, you know, I'm a stage four colon cancer survivor. Certainly my oncologist never, thank you, never laid this out for me. And it's just kind of raising a question in my mind because I look at process and workflow and how useful it would be at the beginning if our oncologist did lay this out for us and say, this is step by step because, you know, when you have cancer, when you're told you have cancer, it's all out of control and everything. And it would be so nice to have some level of control or information or knowing what to expect. And I guess I would um, just like to get your or anybody's feedback on that is, I guess it's, is it too much information to know at the beginning or should we give patients the option of saying, this is the pathway we're gonna follow? Just uh, wondering your thoughts, thank you. Ryan, I'll let you go because I've talked too much. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <clears throat> so, uh, Rick, before I answer this question, are you going to share, um, is this where we're going to stop right here in terms of? No, we're, okay, we're okay. opening the whole new world. <laughs> okay, okay. All right. I, I didn't, didn't want to, <laughs> I didn't want to steal any of your thunder here. Um, so Stacey, uh, I think this has already been an incredibly informative conversation. It touches on a lot of things. Uh, you know, we talked to uh, Steve Abbott uh, uh, just over a week ago about you know this need for improved communication between uh, patients and doctors, um, and this is a fundamental. I mean, this is a really a fundamental tool um, to to help that communication process between the patients and uh, and the doctor. I go one step further too, which is that. An informed patient can really help his or her doctor, uh, his doctor in, in the case, obviously, that we're talking about here. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, Rick and I have gone off and, and we've worked with, you know, life sciences companies to, to do tests um, so that we RNA-seq analysis. And that RNA-seq analysis helps us to identify um, potential targets. And when we identify those targets, that can come into play in terms of the treatment options that we have. The other thing is, is that with testing, um, we believe that there are tests that can help us to determine whether or not even a family of drugs are gonna be useful for us. 
And this is, this is the area that we are probing on. So for example, there is a test called ARV7, which is from Epic Sciences. And there are others um, that can test for AR amplification that- um, AR is androgen receptor. In case. Thank you. <laughs> yep. Which um, is the driving receptor of the prostate. Yeah. So, um, so ARV7 is one, but there are others. Um, and this classification of testing can help inform a doctor and a patient whether or not the patient will respond to, if you look at the, the second box here under uh, guide 10, whether or not we would respond to any of these second line hormone therapies. So if we tested negative for ARV7, we could potentially just write those off and move on to another more responsive uh, treatment. And, um, you know, there are others too. And that's just an example, but uh, Rick's gonna get into a little bit more detail in terms of um, what those options can look like. But to answer your question or provide some perspective, uh, we think that this is an excellent tool to facilitate that conversation between the patient and the doctor. Yeah, so, uh, if I, if I might add to, to, to Stacy's question here, uh, if I had been given this day one, it would have been overload. I would not have understood it, et cetera. And, 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 and it only would be after I had some preliminary education for it to then to be useful to me. So I think it would be something that, hey, it's very useful, but I think it's going to take several sessions of education to get where you need to be. Yep. Yeah. It's, yeah but, just... but yeah, just what the, but I believe you don't, you didn't need to have the whole decision tree based on your situation, you could have selected just one piece. For example, if you started from the node, from the root node, you just need to know about the first two nodes uh, after this one. Then this is a, I think this is gonna be a great, uh, uh, what they call it, a tool, which really you need to build on, on top of this one. It means for many of these branches, it's gonna be expanded. Yeah, I, I, I agree with Saeed, Saeed that it's, there's, there can be personalization in treatment, but there can also be personalization in education, just bringing this all together. Some people are going to be ready for this and some people won't, and they'll be ready at different times and they may want to hear it in different ways. Yeah. We have a couple of uh, hands up. Let me just get Pradeep. Um, thanks, Brad and, and Brian, Rick, this is very informative. I, maybe I'll a, a comment and a question. A comment, uh, Stacey, I think it's really important uh, to communicate uh, to the patients. I, my wife's diagnosed with breast cancer and you know we didn't have the NCC in our knowledge of it, but we got to ask a lot of uh, questions to our oncologist and get a full sense of what the treatment roadmap might look like. But I think that's rare um, and, and not as common. But the question, Brian and Rick, is um, how I'm curious how frequently um, you had your blood panel or the, the test, the PSA measured over the course of this, what looks like a roadmap, um, because my guess is that would inform, you know, seeming progression based entirely on a single marker here, which is PSA. Uh, uh, I'll start yeah. off. Uh, when I was uh, in the left side, uh, I was typically getting PSA measured at the every month. I also had a PSMA that I pushed for and I paid for. You know, it was expensive. Uh, I said, forget about it. I mean, you know, uh, three thousand dollars is expensive, but my life is worth more, and I was lucky to have it. But uh, the longest I was was two months. The longest leash I had was two months. The shortest uh, at right now is three weeks. I'm measured every three weeks. I am on an Arcus clinical trial, so I do get scanned every three months. My last scan was okay. So I'm getting scanned. Uh, my combination of where, when do I figure out that I'm no longer responding to docetaxel is a combination of how I feel, PSA, and the scans. Got it. Can I just ask a follow up? If you were, if if a patient was in the top box, is the set of you know observation or maintenance therapy, is that typical? Uh, you come into the clinic for every month to get your PSA measure. Or is that 
not the case. I got two months okay. <laughs> was <Yeah>. my longest. <laughs> right. So basically, if your PSA is stable or going down on these, uh, you, you get a little longer leash. Up okay. For me, it was up to two months. That was yeah. my longer leash. That was yeah. a very carefree time in my life. <laughs> Uh, there, there, yeah, uh, that's like testing anxiety, right? So I'm going to go get my labs today, you know, um, and I'm, I got a little bit of testing anxiety, you know, am I going to continue to decline or am I going to start to see that it's going to go up? Uh, for me, um, I can tell you that I always pushed for more data. So <laughs> take my, take my, my blood, you know, every other week. I just did a quick look over the course of the past five years, I've had about 50 labs. Um, wow. so it's about, it's, it's about like once just over once a month or so. Um, and, uh, for me, it's always more data, What I would say, and, and Rick is right. is like, if your, if your PSA is like stable or, you know, is stable. Um, I, the sense I got is that, uh, doctors always kind of like would want you to wait a little bit. Um, that proved to be, you know, my case in uh, just over a year and a half ago, and I saw my, my PSA rise double, like at an insane rate. And I waited about two, three months, that one point where I'd been so diligent. And that was, that was a mistake because uh, that's when I developed these six lesions. Okay. Um, we've got 10 minutes left, 10 minute warning. And Jeff Waldron has a question. Yeah, mine's really more a point than a question. Thanks, Brad. I'll be quick. Is that, um, you know, we, we were asking uh, about the NCCA guidelines and how early you should sort of start investigating that. Uh, my point is, you know, as Rick and uh, Brian have told us, they're seeing top people uh, in the San Diego area and, you know, they showed the NCCN uh, uh, board there. Um, I, I'm not a direct pa cancer patient, as most of you know, but uh, every patient I've talked to, you're educating the provider also. So if you're really in a rural area or not an academic medical center, I think there may be a need to be aware of the NCCN guidelines earlier to help educate the provider also. I know that seems counterintuitive to a lot of people, but you know what the people on this call are dealing with really sophisticated academic medical centers. And there was a lot of people with prostate cancer as um, Rick Davis can tell us that are in, you know, uh, not certainly in that situation. Good point, good point. Yeah. Um, Rick, can you bring us home in about five to five? Yeah, minutes? so I'm, I'm really anxious to show you the next slide because this is the end of the standards but it's not the end of your life. So what happens when you graduate guide 12? Well, you know, where do you turn? Um, and this was the whole emphasis of helping advanced ca cancer patients make complex testing and treatment decisions. So what do we do after here? Okay, so this is now uh, a first cut. It's, it's um, not a great, you know, it's not mature, but on the left side, we see the NCCN guidelines. And on the right side, uh, we see clinical trials, which is our hope. And uh, I'm a huge fan of immunotherapy. I, I feel it's our only hope to, for a cure uh, that I know of. Maybe Pluvicto is another fantastic. And I put it here on the left, uh, sorry, on the right, in the last box because it's not in the guidelines yet. It just was approved. You can't, you do not read Blue Victo in the guidelines. So I just, you know, uh, I'll let, it could go left or right, you know, I just put it in there because of the excitement. Okay, so here's a slide that I've been really wanting to cover and I'll do it unfortunately very quickly. There's plenty of time to, we could spend a whole session um, on this slide uh, or, but here we go. So we, in, in clinical trial therapy, there's classes of drugs that are being um, matured. Uh, the most 
some of the most hopeful are immunomodulators. So uh, the, some of this information was uh, uh, obtained from uh, cancerresearch.org and, you know, just common sense uh, that, you know, I've been investigating. So immunomodulators, these are proteins in the tumor microenvironment that uh, in black are immunosuppressive and in blue are tumorcidal. So if uh, common uh, is PDL1, it's the big breakthrough uh, drug program, death ligand one, you are already, be, you know, Brian's already on it, but uh, this is a, a class of immunomodulators. Then there's targeted antibodies. This is another class. I don't know that much about these. Um, you know, I know from my work at Amgen what VEGF is and some of these guys, but why it makes sense for prostate cancer, I've got to learn. So it's some of this I, I'm not an expert on. Vaccines. We, we, uh, we know about PSMA uh, and personalized neoantigen. Perhaps you know about that. I can explain more on another day, but there's some uh, class uh, called vaccines, adoptive cell therapies. Probably everyone's heard of uh, CAR-T. Uh, oncolytic virus, I know about that in other cancers, not so much in prostate, but it was in Cancer uh, Research Institute. Uh, in the prost These are all from prostate uh, classes. And then there's androgen receptor degraders and you know some other, I, I put them down as miscellaneous. So here are the clinical trial classes, maybe not complete, but at least a decent overview. And I think the most hope for me and you know, the knowledge that I have is more in the immunomodulators. Great. So how, so when you're, did any, any questions? No, I was just gonna say um, in, in the spirit of wrapping up, like maybe you could just set up, um, we, should, we should have another session dedicated to this clearly. Okay. And just talk I'll about the right finish side up. and not try to rush it today. Um, mm -hmm. what, 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 what do you want to set up for, like, for, imagine for, you're speaking to the notes or to people. <clears throat> what, what kind of questions or requests would you have of people to react to this? Um, my, uh, my reaction is, out of all these classes, what do you pick? You're already done with NCCN guidelines. You, you still want to live. Your disease is progressing. How do, and then here is the um, testing that this group and you know the, the world, the community is trying to create these tests that will inform which therapy class and which particular therapy clinical trial or uh, that you go on. Like you wouldn't want to pick something wrong, just like, hey, and um, we're, we are way out of population statistics now. We are in personalized medicine. And so what test to figure out what personalized therapy uh, would, would guide that decision? So uh, I will be able to go over, uh, you know, immunohistochemistry, uh, you know, DNA sequencing. Uh, so uh, I, in the, I, I guess what this uh, slide is, immunohistochemistry will inform immunomodulators. DNA sequencing will inform all these classes, help you make decisions. RNA-seq, all these classes. Spatial uh, analysis will inform the immu immunomodulators. Organoid studies, all therapy classes. Um, I don't know about EPIC, so I'll have to punt on that. But then I'll finish with, uh, so this is a perfect time for a question. Did I get this communicated where you're at the end of guidelines, you're out into clinical trial land and you need some testing to help make that decision on which one makes sense. Did, did. Maybe, Rick, maybe if I can just jump in here real quick, because we, we only have a couple minutes and I think mm -hmm. like we, we probably need to set up like where we're going. So I, I think ho hopefully you help people kind of understand essentially how we are looking at integrating testing 
uh, into treatment decision, into the treatment decision process. Um, we are currently working with a number of different uh, companies to um, get them to actually present at, uh, at, at this forum. So for example, we're working right now with Nanostring to hopefully get them to present soon, uh, working with um, uh, a company called S Engine around uh, organoids, and uh, hopefully they're going to present soon. Uh, we can probably pick up some people from uh, from Epic um, to help us understand ARV7. So this is so sort of where we're going here to help educate us and this entire group on how to better integrate uh, these testing um, options into treatment decisions. And I would say along with that, we are working on conversations with um, uh, Bob Gattenby, who is a, uh, uh, he's an evolutionary biologist uh, from the Moffitt Center to help us think about treatment decisions, not as tactics, but strategically. Um, and then also uh, a few other people that I think are gonna hopefully provide uh, a lot more context for how we can improve what these guidelines are today and, and make them really something that it drives personalized, the hope of personalized medicine. I'll end there. Great. So I, I guess that's a, great, that's a great place to close. I'm going to stop the recording.